a little more energised. Thank you, I'm sorry, I know I'm rattling on like I'm just begging for some form of response and attention, but it is nerve-wracking talking to a large group of people that you don't know. That is something that you have to get used to, so I'm doing my best, and you are all too. Uh, is anyone regretting not being at home with their families right now? I won't hold against you. No hands up, that's great. Awesome, all right. Everybody, big round of applause for Josh. Thank you. So, this is exciting. Um, how many of you are founders in the room? Awesome, so about half of you, that's really cool. So how many of you have actually engaged offshore development teams already? Cool, all right, so like the majority of you. Um, I need to hold this quick back. So my name is Josh, I work for a company called Luna, and we do uh, legal accounting and education for startups. So legal kind of means everything from setting up a business all the way through to taking on investment, buying and selling businesses. Um, from an accounting perspective, it's teaching how to use accounting software all the way through to virtual CFO functions. And education is kind of stuff like this. So we um, run workshops and presentations um, to try and get people more educated in the entrepreneurial community to become better founders, and hopefully that means that the failure rate actually decreases. Who knows if that's true. Um, so one thing I'm going to talk about is IP, and what I do know is that it's extremely boring for most people. Um, it's not something that you really think about. This is a failed uh, slide as well. Um, I think that most people actually don't really think about this stuff until it's too late. What we see with early stage founders a lot is that they'll come to us only when there's an issue. And so what's really important about intellectual property in general is that you start thinking about it from the start. And when you start thinking about it from the start, it means that you're going to start building better businesses. So what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about intellectual property. Um, I'm going to try and keep this short, Craig, not as long as yours, um, not too many lists. I'm going to talk briefly about setup for those early stage founders in the room. Um, I know it's sometimes a mixed bag off meetup, so I wasn't sure who would be here. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit about what investors want and the reason, and that's just kind of going to summarize all the points that I've been making here. Cool. So what is IP? Broad definition, something that you create as a result of intellectual activity. Um, that's pretty broad and kind of doesn't tell you too much. So intellectual property is more than an idea. It's maybe an invention, a piece of software, um, brand name, process, or procedure. And that's still really broad. But it's really important to know that IP is the application of an idea. So it's when you take it out of your head and move it into something that is on paper, into an actionable item. So, the reason that you should think about your IP is because it's a valuable asset. It's something that can be commercialized that you can make money from. What you can do with intellectual property is that you can sell it, earn some cash like Econix did. Um, maybe you can license it and earn a fee every time someone uses your product. And so thinking about these things and how you're going to be using it, it's really important that you start thinking, do I actually own it? So, in Australia, the owner of intellect, the creator of intellectual property is the owner. So what that means is that if you create something, you're going to be the owner, and that's really cool. Except, in, there's two exceptions. Um, one is that um, if you have an employer-employee relationship, so if you are working in a company, all the work that you're doing for the business will be automatically owned by the business. Um, and that's really quite clear. And the other exception is when something's transferred in writing. So that's pretty much a contract. Um, so in Australia, if you don't have something that's transferred physically in writing, it means that it's not really yours. And I think this is something that a lot of founders do trip up on, especially at an early stage, is that they think, oh yeah, I'll worry about all this stuff later. I'll think about it when I need to, when I get there. But the issue is, is that five years down the track, it's pretty hard to remember what you were doing in year one, year two, that might be pretty crucial to year five. Um, so thinking about those um, key contracts and starting to think about IP from the very start. And so I guess one common misconception on that is, if you pay for something, it doesn't mean that you own it um, in relation to intellectual property. So when 
So when you've paid for something, you also need to make sure that, hey, has it actually been transferred to me? Now, something that Craig and I were talking about in Ringo um, last week was, do I get all of my IP? So when someone builds something for me, when someone creates something for me, do I just automatically get it all if they transfer it to me? The answer is kind of no. Um, there's, and there's a, big, there's a distinction that we make between background IP and project IP. So background IP is the stuff that exists that two parties bring to the table. Maybe a client brings their logo, maybe an offshore development team brings their skills, um, brings their processes and procedures to make their interactions with clients more efficient. Maybe it's a, it, maybe it's a process you have for making development more efficient. Um, and so all that background IP is not going to actually be transferred to you or owned by you. But what is going to be owned by you is the project IP. So that's the stuff that's developed and created specifically for you. It's the end product of what's being built. Um, I think the easiest analogy is the cake analogy. I want, a, I want a cake. I want the most disruptive innovative cake in the whole world. Um, and I go to a chef and I say, chef, please make me this disruptive innovative cake that no one else has seen before. And the chef says, cool, I'm going to make you a cake. Um, and he makes me the cake and honestly, it's the best thing I've ever eaten. It's, it's amazing. Um, and I say, I want to own that whole, whole cake. And he says, cool, well, the cake's yours. You can take it. And so it's really important that the background that I paid for the cake, every cake probably has eggs, flowers, and water. Eggs, flour, and water. Um, but I don't get to just own the eggs, flour, and water because I'm pretty sure that everyone's using eggs, flour, and water to make cakes. But what I do get to own is the result of what he's put in. So the recipe may be the final product. Any questions? Cool. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Thank you. Um, so I just want to quickly touch on that's IP. Um, in a real nutshell, try and bring it into something that's quick and easy and within 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so, I guess setting up for success, a lot of founders talk about the way that they have to set up, and they're thinking, what do I do? I'm starting a company. What do I need to think about? And I guess it's really easy to set up as a sole trader. So that's when you go online, apply for your own ABN, and you're like, yep, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to start my own business. And that's really good because it's easy and fast. But as things start to get more sophisticated, you start to grow, things become a little bit more difficult. Um, your risk increases. And if something goes wrong, it's kind of you that's personally liable to like, bear the cost if anything does. Where setting up as a PTY LTD or a company is really good. It means a broad PTY LTD company is a separate legal entity. What that means is that a PTY LTD company can enter into contracts it can sue and be sued, and it's separate from you yourself. Now let's take the example of two co-founders working together. It's really good because two co-founders can own an equal share in a business, and a business can be the place where they bank their intellectual property. And the intellectual property has, may have been created by other parties, or either of them individually, and it's being stored in one place. Now this is also really good for investment, because an investor can come along and say, hey, I know where everything is. I know that everything is exactly as, as what I want to invest in. Um, an investor can't come to a sole trader and say, hey, can I invest in you because you physically can't split yourself up into parts and no matter how hard you try, it's probably not going to work. So, what do investors want? <coughs> investors want to see that you actually own your IP, so that, have, do you have documentation to prove that you're the owner? Um, have you made sure that your offshore team has actually assigned this to you? Um, do you have a structure that allows them to easily invest in your business? So do they set up as a, as a company? Um, and then the last thing is, is your IP protected? And I haven't touched on this, but this is talking about things like patents and trademarks and registered designs. So patents, trademarks and registered designs in short, um, a way of protecting your intellectual property, um, most often, they don't apply too much to software development. Um, in certain circumstances, they can. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll chat to you after this. Um, and then, I guess just working with offshore teams, a few tips, some things that we see to make it sure it goes right. Have the conversation early. When you start engaging them, actually talk about it and say, who's the owner? Who gets to, who, what do I get and what do you get? 
Um, understand that the legal docs that you're using are probably more than words. So they actually set out your relationship for how you're going to be working together, set out your responsibilities, set out how often you should be communicating with each other. Um, and where possible, sign those docs before you start, because they're pretty useless right at the end when everyone wants to get away from each other. Um, and I think what Craig was touching on in his presentation is that it's all about relationships. So you can have as many legal documents as you want, you can have as many processes and procedures, but if you're not a nice person um, and your offshore development team deletes your GitHub account, sorry. There's not much you can do, right? So make sure that you continue managing relationships, being in constant communication, and being a nice person. And that's it. Awesome. All right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that, I think there will be. Does anyone have any questions? Great. Awesome. Josh, you stand up here, and I'll take the microphone. Around. All right. So, uh, oh, there's another microphone. Oh, does this work? Yep, it does. Uh, can you talk a little bit about trade secret protection and the idea that? have to keep it secret through its life cycle. So a lot of people start by using Dropbox and other um, places where it's really difficult to prove that it's been protected. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's a, it's important to make a distinction between what is your secret source and what are people seeing. Um, your trade secret protection is your secret source. And so whatever way you can protect that as best as possible from getting into too many people's hands. You have to remember that when you have an idea or you're trying to develop something, the person, if you're engaging an offshore team, it's likely that their whole reason for being is to provide those services to you and not to take your idea away from you. So understanding that going into the relationship and understanding that your secret source is probably yours to keep, just making sure that it's away from the people who might be who might put it at risk. Well, that makes sense. I may be the only person in the room who needs this, but could you define trade secret protection? Yeah, so I, I was just inferring the meaning of trade secret protection, but that's kind of like the important stuff to your business that makes you unique from everyone else. Is that right? Cool. Uh, do you have a follow-up question at all? <coughs> cool. <coughs> hmm? No, yeah, that's, right. that's right. Like, I'm also commercially uh, uh, youthful. Youthful. <laughs> <laughs> hey, David here. Um, you uh, were talking about uh, sole traders and P2R Limited. Mm -hmm. Is there any space for trust in a startup entrepreneur scene? Yeah, definitely. So trusts are really interesting structures from a legal perspective, from an everyday person perspective, not, not all that interesting. But the thing about it, so there's a lot of different types of trusts. Um, one trust that investors can invest in for a startup is a unit trust. Um, but there are most other trusts they can't invest in. So if you're looking for an investable business model, it does make it a little bit more difficult. Does that answer your question? Does anyone else have questions? Yeah, get a question. Hi, Josh. Fires here. Uh, just want to understand the cake example for your cake. Uh, like, you know, who wants the IP into the real cake example? So who wants the IP? IP. Because I, no, I, I, I want to the so the person who's going to be using it is the person who wants to own it. So in an investor example, um, you'll have you'll, you'll want the IP that's relevant to your business, and that makes you have an investable business model. So in the cake example, I'm not the IP one. The chef is the chef is the one. Right, and so he has to transfer it to you in writing before you can have it. That's super important. Great. A whole bunch more hands went up. Well, awesome. <laughs> you a good topic, man. Yeah, man. Um, I was just wondering if you were to, uh, I guess, uh, involve contractors for work, essentially, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I guess they've got their own IP, I guess. Um, so, who wants, wants um, IP for a particular sort of work that I would give them to? Mm -hmm. That needs to be the work. Um, I guess um, when you are a startup, you're going to be on IP as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I guess my question is, who's going to own it? And yeah, so that's a that's a really common question. It's not something that 
your, it would be unique to you. A lot of people when they're engaging contractors want to make sure they own their IP. Um, but so there's two ways you can do it. You can sign an agreement at the start, like a contractor agreement that sets out your terms of engagement. In that agreement, it should say something about you owning the IP. Um, or you can do it after the engagement's finished um, and sign a document to say, this is what you've developed for me and now you're gonna hand it over to me. But until either of those things are done, you're probably not gonna be the owner of that IP. That's, that's important, so we've got one, two, three, we got four, five. We'll do a couple more and we'll go through as many as, a, as I just saw, like five more and we'll try and be quick and then we'll cut it because, you know, it's getting late. Good question, so. Hi, uh, it's Shroj. So my question is like, um, when you're bootstrapping, equity alone, how legal is that? Sorry, could you repeat If you're just getting someone equity alone, uh, not paying a salary, mm -hmm. how legal is that? I mean, <sighs> Let's talk about it after. <laughs> uh, one, more, one more question for yeah. Craig. I mean, Craig, you, you did a very good um, presentation. Thank you. Let's go on the stage. I think there's a good a question for you as well. Um, Culture fit, um, as opposed to outsourcing, um, I'm a bit worried about this uh, as in, like, in the long run. Like when you are a founder, you want to keep your team for quite a bit, like, as in the founding team, first 10 to 25 com uh, employees of your the company. So you want to keep them for the long run. I mean, everyone's in the game for the up to the stage of IPO and then they all leave. So how do you go about you know, dealing with that, um, just trying to keep everyone in the game? Just talk to people, right? It's just humans working with humans. Like, I mean, there's common sense, there's a lot of it, right? Like I use Accenture and ANZ Bank as, an, as an, a contrasting example to your five person startup and my 12 person development team. Like, yeah, we're much more fit for each other than Accenture and ANZ are for each other, right? So it's just that sort of stuff. It's also, people will keep on bouncing into me about the agile development stuff because people know me for that. Um, just, you know, apologies to those in, in the room that are service providers, but people ask the dumbest question about like their, their sense making and, and trying to figure out stuff around what good agile software development is like. And some people just say the most, to me, the most stupid things, right? You know, I, I want to be polite, I want to be nurturing and supportive and all that sort of stuff, but um, to kind of treat Agile software development as primarily a process control method loses all of the opportunity of co-creation and creativity and working together and all that sort of stuff that's in that new view of ideas, right? So it's just like knowing who you're working with and are you on the same page about stuff? And yeah, next question. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Josh. Um, so if you got a got a sole trader, okay, and then there's a you are, Obviously, with the benefits that you're going towards, you want to register a business now, but stuff's moving quickly. And so if you sign over the IP to the sole trader, how difficult it is to get across to the, the company further down the line? Pretty easy, one dog, two pages. Are you adding it to yourself? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Remember that the company is a separate, yeah. a separate person, so you're giving it to the company, yeah. but you're not going to control it. Yeah. That's good. Um, so signing IP and using these documents, what does a document look like? How easy is it? How is it structured? So the structure is kind of talking about the different elements of the law that are required to assign IP, um, going through all the different types of intellectual property that you're assigning. Um, so sometimes you're just assigning a logo or a business name. Sometimes you're assigning um, source code. Sometimes you're assigning software. Um, so it talks about what you're assigning, describes it, um, and transfers it over to the other person. Also talks about other rights. Um, there are th there's things called moral rights, which no one really talks about, no one knows about. There's, what's a moral right? What's a moral right? Wow. Well, a moral right is the right of a creator to have their name on the thing that they've developed. Um, and what you really want is if you, someone else has developed something for you, you kind of don't want to have to do that. So having that clearly set out as well is usually a bit helpful. Hey, great to talk both, so thanks for that. Um, I wanted to touch on everything's gone to shit and your uh, outsourced team are in some shady, untrustable country like the US. 
and <laughs> then you have to persecute your intellectual property. What one of the challenges that you face there? Yeah, there's like disputes are like this really big bucket of challenge. It's a really big challenge, and to try and solve them, there's probably there's a few methods that you can go through. One is money. Money talks. If you have money, then you can then you can convince someone to do anything. Um, <laughs> kind of, right? Um, I'm not the only one in the room who's thinking that. Um, um, but otherwise, you know, just um, doing a real damn best to like open a line of communication. And as we've been harping on about, it's just about like building trust back, and you know, even things have gone shit, might be a bit shady. Um, it can actually stall the business. And so thinking about it from day one and not on the day that you have that problem is probably the best solution. But we can talk about it more. <laughs> Don't have the problem, but we can talk about it more. I can add to it, right? If you're in a serious dispute with either a customer or with partners, don't trivialise it, don't put it to the side and put it off, like grab onto it straight away and deal with it as aggressively, not, not aggressively as you might be an arsehole, but like focus on it, pay attention to it, move this thing through the process that it needs to, including like that might mean you personally have to kind of drop everything else to get it done because it will hold up your business and fuck everything else up. Exactly. One more thing for this one. Was he on? Was he on? So last two. If you want, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask very short questions, but the uh, answer might be maybe complicated in that case. You can, um, you can tell me straight away you say, you know, you answer that, answer, that's fine. Um, so basically, what if, you know, in, this, in, this, in the very beginning of your, of your business, um, you, you express your idea to a few friends who uh, respond very positively, and you start coming together with an equal share of everybody. But, as everybody understand that a startup take would require a lot of input from uh, you know the creativity of, of each member and, and the personal effort of each member instead of the actual money that put in there. You can work from home, you can work from anywhere uh, with your own intellectual effort to provide the input which create the value of the company. And then but you know, down the track, everybody is um, always running into different issues and um, people slack off from the contribution or lack off from the determination of pursuing the same purpose of the very beginning. In those cases, there's any legal ways that you can sort of work with the members who don't willingly relinquish their share of the company. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's like a really interesting question. And important like, question. Founder disputes are really difficult to deal with. Um, they're not uncommon, um, but there are things that you can do to alleviate them. Um, one thing that often works surprisingly well is getting everyone in a room with someone who you all know and trust mutually to talk about the issue. But one thing you can do preemptively before any of that stuff happens you might have heard or read about a shareholders agreement or a founders agreement. Signing that at the start, even if you don't go through the legals, but just writing it down between yourselves until you get to the time when you can afford to do it together um, and talking about what each person's going to be doing, what the expectation is and what happens if someone wants to leave, then you can kind of iron out those issues quite early on. Is that all? Awesome. Yeah. Last, yeah. Question, last question, guys. Can I go? Um, my my questions um, maybe to both of you because I think it falls into the, the operating a overseas team and also the legal side of things. Um, there's often a cultural divide between teams that work overseas and how you go through the problem of trying to manage. You know, uh, if, if if I'm talking to people and I say, "Hey, you know, I, I I want this," and people nod, and it's it's more that they're nodding because culturally it's impolite to say no. Uh, how, how what's the process? Be- for managing that stuff, how do you handle that legally? Do you need to put things in place to try and manage that if it gets to the worst? And I think you've, you've already talked too about you know nipping these problems in the bud quite early. Um, but how, what's what's the process? What do you do to, to, to manage those sort of problems? I'll hand it over. No, I'll give you, you can have a go first. Sorry. <laughs> so just the other day, my partner 
in my business, Frank and Nathan lives in India and I live in Australia. And we bring all our cultural background and heritage together. And one thing that really bugs me about him, hi Indian guys in the room, is okay, let's get together in three hours and have a meeting. And he's like, I'll be there in some time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So, you know, we've been working together for a couple of years now, and I just go, what does some time mean? Right? And so, for him and me, the deal is it's just rapport and the ability to call each other out. Like there's something that we're trying to do as a business and he doesn't want to do it and I do want to do it and we're chatting and I'm like, come on man, you're chicken. He's like, what does chicken mean? <laughs> right, so I have to explain the metaphor of chicken, right? Yeah, and it's just like you just have to talk through this shit and just like be generous and know that, you know, what I've noticed also is in, in um, bigger businesses, people that are really successful in their careers are the people that just start with open arms and a willingness, willingness to trust, right? And people that struggle in their careers, they kind of hit a plateau, they hit a level, and then they're kind of a good technically proficient person, but they don't scale up in the organisation and their impact and imprint on the organisation doesn't scale beyond that are the ones that need things to be right before they can trust, right? If you can just get in there and you can just go, we've all got the best intentions, we're all trying to do the right thing and we will make mistakes, but we'll talk through it, that'll get you. That'll get you moving forward. As for legal disputes, <laughs> <laughs> legal disputes with overseas teams are really hard. Yep. Um, yeah, that's the long and the short of it. They're really, really difficult. Um, from a legal perspective, working in a developing country, for example, India, I think it's like, I don't know, six to eight months before you can book in a court date in the future. So, if you're thinking about using the court system in India to kind of try and resolve your dispute, you're going to have a bad time. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so, so you say that the contract is, you know, it's dependent on working in Victoria. Yes. So, so, you, so you can mention that the contract is dependent on working in Victoria. I think what's really important and the most important is that if the relationship's not going well, you cut it at its knees. Um, and if, um, and yeah, just be a good person. Yeah, that's like, that's kind of it. I see so many relationships fall down just because one party is a little bit too aggressive. Yeah. And so just, that's my two cents. Great, yeah, and the last thing I'm trying to add to that is that it invariably it's, it's deep empathy that makes a really, really, really big difference. And it's easy when you're a buyer or a seller in a corporate relationship to forget that we're all people and you start to treat it really transactionally. So sometimes you just have to step back and go, Oh, you know what? It, it's meant to be hard. Time zones are difficult, logistics are difficult, internet in Australia sucks, which really makes things difficult doing video conferencing. So there's a whole bunch of barriers you have to come over to get it right. So we're done, we're pretty much done. Uh, I was going to do an exercise after this, but I feel a little frightened. I'm going to just, I, everyone put up your hand if you want to do one more exercise. No, yes, yes, <laughs> exercise is done. Uh, the last exercise is stand up and go introduce yourself to someone new. Uh, someone that you don't know. Uh, I, I always hate when I come to these things and I stand kind of awkwardly in my shell and I don't meet anyone new. So to finish it all off, get up, find someone new, introduce yourself, say hello, give one more round of applause to both these guys. <laughs> Thank you for dedicating your evening. Thank you for your patience and have a good night. Cheers. Bye.